A lot of people are celebrating the quote-unquote conservative victory recently at the Southern Baptist Convention 2023 of the removal of two churches, including Rick Warren's church, Saddleback, for, quote, not being in friendly cooperation with the SBC over having female pastors. But I'm not convinced that this was a conservative victory at all. So you might have heard that Rick Warren's church, Saddleback, was kicked out of the SBC. So what actually happened was a few months back, there was a vote to disfellowship his church for not being in friendly cooperation with the SBC over the idea of, uh, or well, over the fact that they have women pastors on their staff. And if, regardless of what you believe about egalitarianism or complementarianism, egalitarianism being the belief that uh, women are allowed biblically to be pastors and the more biblical position that uh, complementarianism that the Bible teaches that women um, cannot be pastors that that is a a role that is an office that is exclusive to men uh, regardless of what you think about that the SBC has a policy in place um, in their in their uh, rules, in their, what's it called? The Baptist Faith and Message, that's what it's called, uh, that limits the office of pastor to men. And so uh, there's been kind of a dust-up recently in the SBC about churches with female pastors, particularly Rick Warren's church. And a few months ago, they voted to disfellowship uh, his church on this grounds, and he had a chance to appeal the decision, which he did, and the vote, uh, after he got a chance to speak at the actual convention, was cast and his church lost the appeal. So they, they attempted to appeal and the appeal was denied. So that was one church, Saddleback Church, which uh, Rick Warren has said himself that I believe just a couple years ago, we'll read this in a moment, uh, a tweet of his uh, where he describes kind of his his recent conversion to egalitarianism. But regardless of what, uh, how long ago it was, Rick Warren very recently in history became an egalitarian. And it seems as though once he did, he became very aggressively and violently egalitarian <laughs> to the point that like he, he seems to, uh, it's like he, he argues in, in the audio clip that I'm, or in the video I'm about to play for you of his, uh, his speech he seems like he uh, he keeps saying, like, I don't want complementarians to change their minds. I just want you to accept me the way that I am, which is ironic because that's a very similar argument to what we hear from um, other kinds of gender-confused or sexually deviant Christians in regards to, uh, you know, confusion with male or female or the... the uh, the proper behavior of males and females in different relational aspects. And Rick Warren is taking this exact same avenue of debate, saying that, hey, I'm an egalitarian. I want to interpret scripture in this way that says that women can be pastors, even though the Baptist faith and message says we can't. And the Bible uh, obviously says that women are not allowed to be pastors, but I'm going to ignore those verses, says Rick Warren. Um, but I want you to accept me anyway. You know, I, I want to be inclusive here, just like his church. Uh, the other church that was disfellowshipped, appealed, and then uh, the appeal was denied, was a church that actually had a female head pastor for 30 years. Yes, you heard that right. 30 years. Uh, I don't understand how this could be happening. Where churches, and, and it's a lot more than these two, incidentally, and we'll find that out in a moment. But the, the the fact that there could be a, a female head pastor at a church for 30 years that is being represented at the SBC. I don't know. How come this wasn't taken care of 30 years ago? How come this church wasn't disfellowshipped from the SBC 30 years ago or 25 years ago? How can, I mean, this is a pretty major thing in Christianity. This is a, a huge topic of division, and I think rightfully so, 
in a lot of denominations and even churches, complementarianism and egalitarianism. It's a, it's a big doctrinal deal. It says, like, do we take God's created order seriously or do we take God's created order not seriously? Do we take clear commands of Scripture where Paul says that very, like very clearly, I do not allow women to teach and exercise authority over men in the church? Uh, or do we ignore that? Or do we say, ah, it's just a cultural thing? Uh, and, and if we do that, we could say anything in the Bible is just a cultural thing. Ah, that was just a cultural thing that they, you know, said sin was bad. I mean, you know, because obviously we think sin is good now. And so what we're doing by saying it's a cultural thing with with pretty much anything in the Bible is that we're actually placing culture over clear scripture. We're placing, uh, we're saying culture is the interpretive key and not the Bible itself. The, the, the Bible is subservient to the culture. And that's a serious problem. So first, I want to go ahead and read Rick Warren's tweet. This, this happened, so the, the SBC convention was just a couple weeks ago. It was very recent. And I wanted to kind of see how things played out before I talked about it too much. I wanted to see how the vote went. Uh, I, I was kind of following a lot of Rick Warren's tweets um, previous to this. But again, like I said, I wanted to see how it played out. And so I'm going to give you the, the full story from before the SBC convention to now. So Rick Warren tweeted something fascinating. He went on a kind of a tirade on social media over the past few months against the SBC, very aggressively, uh, very accusatory, uh, very, it comes across very arrogant and pompous. Uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube, you can even see that he tweeted completely in bold letters. Normally people don't do that, but Rick Warren, uh, you know, aside from having grammatical errors, which I will, uh, you know, I will read his text faithfully. So any, any kind of mistakes in the text is mistakes that he wrote, this very highly educated pastor who probably you know, must have thought this out very much, except not quite enough to not have blatant spelling and grammatical errors, uh, but but also decided to write the tweet in bold. So here we go. He says this on uh, June 10th, 2023, Rick Warren says this, my biggest regret in, f- my biggest regret, biggest regret in 53 years of ministry is that I didn't do my own personal exegesis sooner over the four passages used to restrict women. Shame on me. I wasted those four years of Greek in college and seminary. When I finally did my proper, quote, due diligence, laying aside 50 years of bias, I was shocked, chagrined, and embarrassed. So many hermeneutical rules were being violated, including never build a doctrine on a sinnel, he meant to say single, word that is used only once, italics, in scripture, exclamation point. There is nothing to compare it to, parentheses, correlation, uh, and there's also no period at the end of the sentence. (laughs) Uh, never, it's, it's hard to read. Never build a doctrine on a single word that's used only once in scripture. There's nothing to compare it to. Do your own study of authentian in (laughs) ancienty Greek. He means to say ancient and you'll be shocked too. Yeah. In the, in the first paragraph, there are like three significant errors. This is the, the quality. I mean, this is the pure quality of content that this guy puts out the the thoughtful commentary on (laughs) if (laughs) we we want to (laughs) people actually trust what this guy says (laughs) they he's saying i read i read the bible and i can't even type english (laughs) it's pretty good i i hope he can read greek better than he can type english Anyway, let's go on. This is funny. I think maybe it was because I didn't want, that's that's in all caps, to know anything that might challenge the view I wanted to believe for 50 years. But eventually, <laughs> it's, it's hard to get through this with a straight face. 
Uh, eventually, integrity required that I read over 70 commentaries by inerrantist scholars that blew apart my comfortable, traditional, and culture-based interpretation. No seminary told me those commentaries even existed, and Baptist bookstores refused to carry them. Uh, So, I accepted the interpretation that was most comfortable for me as a man with my background. Okay. Then, reading over 100 books on the early church and the history of the Great Commission uh, for FTT, parentheses, demanded my repentance. That journey was both painful and humbling. I don't expect to win in New Orleans. And I certainly don't expect to change the mind of any angry fundamentalist. (laughs) They are responsible to God, not to me. In doing this as an act of obedience to the Holy... Oh no, I am doing this as an act of obedience to the Holy Spirit. Almost done. But I do, all caps, want to do this. I publicly apologize, all caps, To every good woman in my life, church, and ministry that I failed to speak up for in my years of ignorance. What grieves me is that I hindered them in obeying the Great Commission Command. I've never heard it being called that before. The Great Commission Command. And, parentheses, Acts 2, 17-18. That everyone, all caps, is to teach in the church. I held them back. He's saying he's he's held back women from accomplishing the Great Commission because he's uh, he was following the Bible for 50 years. Uh, I held them back from using the spiritual gifts and leadership skills that the Holy Spirit had sovereignly placed in them, which presumably he's talking about preaching in the church, which Paul explicitly condemns. That breaks my heart now, and I am truly repentant and sorry for my sin. I wish I could do it all over. Christian women, will you please forgive me? Regardless of attacks and the vote result, I want a clear conscience before my master. Ellipses. That I repented and that this sinner did what he asked me to do. With that, I am completely content to let him be the judge and evaluator of my life and ministry. We must live for an audience of one. Which is ironic because he's tweeting this to a lot of people. And during his Twitter tirades, Rick Warren uh, multiple times announced how many churches were on his side. And we'll see this happen again, incidentally. But also you'll notice if you're watching the video, it says, My apology to Christian women from Rick Warren, 1 John 1, 6 through 9. Now, this is interesting. First. John 1, uh, 6 through 9. Let's really quickly just see what this says. 1 John 1, 6 through 9. I'll just read the New International Version because that's probably what Rick Warren reads. <laughs> it says, "If John 1, 6 through 9. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Now, a couple of things to note. One thing is, it seems as though Rick Warren took a screenshot of this text, and the the little cursor is... uh, (laughs) is on the screen next to two he didn't click off the text to take this screenshot he just left the cursor there really low quality (laughs) and there's also a random dot on the screenshot i don't know why it's kind of confusing anyway uh but to the main point which is the scripture that he quotes that he puts this entire tweet in context with it's basically saying if you live if you walk in darkness then you are not in fellowship with jesus it sounds like what rick warren is saying is is putting this in context with is if you walk in the darkness that he used to walk in which is the darkness of complementarianism which is the darkness of believing what the bible says about the office of pastor 
you are not in fellowship with Jesus Christ. So just think about that. Rick Warren is repenting for something that's not actually a sin, and he is sinning not only by repenting for something that's not a sin, but by, uh, you know, being so obnoxious. <laughs> so uh, I also want to play this video. So yeah, I'll just also remember that was all in bold. <laughs> Oh man, Rick Warren is just endless, endless content. So I want to play this video that uh, Rick of Rick Warren's speech right before, um, the, sometime before the vote uh, at the SBC convention. Now something interesting is that right after Rick Warren got up to speak, Al Mohler got up to speak as well. I won't be playing that, but you can look it up yourself. Uh, it's pretty good. What Al Mohler says is good. I don't think Al Mohler's a good guy. I think he's a big Eva goon who uh, goes wherever the, the cultural winds blow. But what he said here was really good. But we're just going to be focusing on what Rick Warren said. So here we go. Blend of at least a dozen different tribes of Baptists. If you think every Baptist thinks like you, you're mistaken. What we share in common is a mutual commitment to the inerrancy and the infallibility of God's word and to the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. No one is asking any Southern Baptist to change their theology. I'm not asking you to agree with my church. I am asking you to act like a Southern Baptist who have historically agreed to disagree on dozens of doctrines in order to share a common mission. Since Southern Baptists have always allowed disagreement on doctrines, of, including the essential doctrines of salvation, why should this one issue cancel our fellowship? In 2013, when the Calvinists were under fire, Baptists agreed to disagree and the split was averted. Now, 10 years later, will we treat egalitarian Baptists with the same grace we showed the Calvinist? We should remove churches for all kinds of sexual sin, racial sin, financial sin, leadership sin, sins that harm the testimony of our convention. But the 1,928 churches with women on pastoral staff have not sinned. If doctrinal disagreements between Baptists are considered sin, we all get kicked out. You'll never get 100% of Baptists to agree 100% on 100% of doctrine. That's why our Constitution says that churches must closely identify, not completely identify, with our cons confession. Now, the Baptist faith and message is 4,032 words. Saddleback disagrees with one word. That's 99.9999999999 in agreement. Isn't that close enough? Al Mohler, who for some reason gets to speak twice and do the rebuttals, claims the phrase, the office of the pastor is limited to men, that that also includes every staff position too, and somehow it also prevents any woman from teaching. But I was able to contact about half, over half of the original drafting committee of the Baptist Based Message 2000, and seven of them told me Al was wrong. In fact, before the vote on the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, even Al in his hometown newspaper said it didn't limit women from being assistant pastors. Go read it in the Courier Journal. If this precedent is set, Southern Seminary will have to change the name of the Billy Graham School since Billy Graham trained women pastors at our global training events and he endorsed the preaching ministry of his daughter saying Anne is the best preacher in, in the Graham family. Vote no. If this precedent is set, we'll have to rename our two. I'm very sorry, but the time has expired. <laughs> oh, they cut him off. That never gets old. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. So last year, if you look up last year's uh, SBC meeting, Rick Warren, man, they... They cut good guys off. They they didn't even give good guys the mic. Like there was a a big uh, rigmarole with Tom Buck and his wife, where they wanted to speak. I believe they wouldn't even give them the mic, you know, because the leadership they run the show. And um, so so like they 
they give people extra time if they like them. They don't give them any time or they cut them off right on time if they don't like them, right? And, <laughs> and so, like, this is a clear sign <laughs> that they are sick of Rick Warren <laughs> right now. But last year, he got, like, minutes more than he was supposed to. Uh, and so I guess they paid him back. So that's cool. Uh, but notice in his speech that we just listened to, he, uh, all of the people he attacks, he attacks Al Mohler, probably the most obvious. And he says things like, well, Al gets to talk twice. <laughs> that's not something you do. Just from a, like a tactical perspective, you don't attack the people in charge. And in this case, you know, maybe Rick Warren isn't used to this, but Rick Warren isn't in charge here. You know, he's he's at the mercy of the leadership of the convention, and he's also at the mercy of the vote of the members of the messengers at the SBC. Uh, he, he also attacks Calvinists, and a, a huge chunk of the SBC are Calvinists. Uh, he, he says that, like, there's a disagreement on the essential doctrine of salvation, and he brought that up last year, too. What he's talking about is the idea of uh, limited atonement. He somehow thinks, I believe that that's, like, entirely horrible and unbiblical and awful. And, uh, you know, we, we ought to admit that people who believe in limited or unlimited atonement are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so give it a rest, chill out. Basically, all that means is that uh, Calvinists believe that Jesus, uh, his death was only for the people who accept him uh, and not for everybody, including the people who don't accept him. Because then in that case, that would mean that Jesus... Uh, Jesus's death is essentially useless for the people who don't accept him. And so like uh, it's not effective. Jesus, Jesus's death is not effective enough to save people. And so that, you know, that's the reason that Calvinists believe that. Uh, But all that aside, he attacks Calvinists uh, again in his talk. And he's like, well, that's, you know, that is worse than egalitarianism. All I am is an egalitarian. He, he also says, he, he attacks fundamentalists. He he refers to, he's like angry fundamentalists, you know, and he did that in his tweet earlier. So he's attacking fundamentalists. And, you know, a lot of people there would probably consider themselves a, a fundamentalist, depending on how that's defined. If you just say, yeah, I believe the fundamentals of the Bible, I would consider myself a fundamentalist. So, yeah. Um, he also says very clearly, it is not sin for someone to have a women pastor on their staff. And what's really interesting, if we compare what he says here to what he said in his tweet earlier, what he did say was a sin was him being a complementarian. So he's basically coming in front of the entire SBC and saying, I'm not sinning by being an egalitarian. Although actually, I believe that every single one of you are sinning by being a complementarian. So he's not sinning by being egalitarian, but they are because he said that he was sinning when he was a complementarian because that prevents women from accomplishing the Great Commission. You'll also notice that he seemed angry. He seemed exasperated, uh, red in the face, sweating, (laughs) throws attacks at members of the SBC, even the even the respected leadership, uh, for better or worse, like Al Mohler. He comes across as divisive, selfish, power hungry, and childish. He's clearly, clearly not on a path right now of getting his way. And so he's backed into a corner and he's attacking. He's he's like, I'm going down and I'm gonna take everybody down with me. He's throwing a temper tantrum. And this is evident also. Because of the tirade that I mentioned that he has been going on for months on social media against the SBC. Uh, I also want to focus on a few of the points he made that uh, are are actually really good points. Things that I agree with, <laughs> but maybe not in the way that you think. So one, he says, hey, if, you, if you're not okay with egalitarianism, we need to re- Name the Billy Graham Center because Billy Graham said my daughter is one of the best preachers ever. Uh, one, that's an appeal to authority, which is a classic Big Eva move. Uh, but like I said, he has a good point. 
it's a stupid argument, but he has a good point, which is, uh, you know, I'm all for people finally admitting that Billy Graham was not the great preacher that history sees him as. This is one of the reasons for that, that uh, Billy Graham was evidently okay with egalitarianism, among other things. He also said that we agree with 99% of what the Baptist faith and message says, but we disagree with one word, uh, and it's not a big deal. Now, I think it was really interesting for him to bring this up because this is so revelatory of the way that a lot of these people think. Now, I don't know if he was actually being sincere or he just caught this zinger from somewhere and decided to put it in his speech because he also tweeted this. Uh, he, he thought it was a big enough deal that he decided to tweet it. This tweet is not in bold. But he said this in his tweet on June 11th, one day after the previous tweet. He says, the SBC Constitution was changed in 2015 after 170 years of Baptist cooperation. Now, churches must be closely, all caps, identified with our confession. Not completely. No period. Our Baptist Faith and Message 2000 is 4,032 words. We disagree with only one word, men. <laughs> We're 99.99999 repeating uh, percent in agreement. Is that not close enough? All caps. So the... He, he thought this was such a good point that he repeated it in his speech. He tweeted it and then he repeated it in his speech. The stupidity of this statement is astonishing. Rick Warren could not have come up with something more stupid if he hired a professional stupid person to write this. Uh, because he is the professional stupid person. The issue with this is you can change one word in anything a very particular important word and you can entirely change the meaning the the value of the word men <laughs> uh, holds a lot of weight and so it's a stupid argument uh, but it, but it's really I mean I'm glad he brought it up just because it shows us how stupid the guy is okay but the but the third point that I thought was very interesting that I'm glad he brought up was he said 1928 churches in the SBC have women on pastoral staff, not just staff, but pastoral staff. Now, assuming that he's even accurate with the number, uh, that's a lot of churches. And herein lies the problem for the SBC. I think, so a lot of people are celebrating Rick Warren being kicked out, but what they're celebrating, I think, is like, yes, the SBC isn't lost yet. Awesome. They did a they did the right move. They kicked Rick Warren out. Awesome. Uh, I don't think that's a victory. I don't think that's the victory we should be celebrating. I think justice was done here, and we got to see Rick Warren have an awesome public conniption, and it was hilarious. And uh, you know he's he's disgraced. He just retired as the the head pastor recently, uh, but he's still somehow involved heavily in the church. So I don't really know what the deal is, but he's supposedly retired um and and so like this is how rick warren goes out he's disgraced he he goes out on a huge massive loss it's awesome uh but i don't think this is a conservative victory at all for the sbc because of what rick warren said about these nearly 2000 churches with women on pastoral staff the sbc is not complementarian they pretend to be. Now, you might say to me, Cody, obviously they're complementarian or they wouldn't have voted to remove these two churches from fellowship, especially Saddleback, a church that was bringing them so many church plants and giving them so much money. Nope. And here's why. Remember how much trouble Rick Warren has been causing the SBC over the past year? What Big Eva does, what the evangelical elites do, is that they don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to be troubled. They want to stay in power. They want to, to go along the track at their own pace and do the things they want to do unimpeded. 
And even if another uh, another leftist, you know, because the SBC is coasting like off a cliff on the left. And even if another leftist comes up and challenges the way they're doing things, they will eat them alive. And that's exactly what they did with Rick Warren. Rick Warren was an ally. They treated him so well last year. Uh, but since this vote, and I, I don't exactly know how this vote happened, uh, but you know, it's it's interesting to see this play out. But I, the SBC obviously does not care about complementarianism. Now that that doesn't say that that individual SBC churches don't, because obviously many of them do, because they voted to remove Rick Warren. But I don't think that's the um, that's not what the leadership is ultimately gaining from this. And another reason that we know this is is right after this vote or sometime around the vote, uh, there was a prior president of the SBC. I forgot his name, uh, but you can look this up. Uh, and and he was backed by affirming nods of other prior SBC presidents. J.D. Greer was there, but it wasn't J.D. Greer who made this motion. But but this previous president of the SBC made a motion to create a committee. What he said was, he said, quote, I am complementarian to the core. But, he went on to say, we should make a committee to really define what a pastor is, uh, which essentially affirms that they're open to complementarianism. I mean, I'm sorry, that they're open to egalitarianism. They're open to the to the idea of the SBC voting that, yeah, maybe we can't have female pastors. And this was a, a prior president of the SBC, and he was being backed up by other presidents of the SBC, the, the elite of the elite, the cream of the crop. It's crazy. So my theory is that they removed Rick Warren not because they actually care that much about complementarianism but because they just don't like rick warren this was purely a political move this was big eva devouring itself essentially rick warren who is big time big eva was pushing against the sbc and trying to muscle them where he wanted them to go and they weren't having it and because they're the ones with the microphones they're the ones in leadership they're the ones who were voted into these positions for president whatever else they're the ones in control, and so they can muscle back. And what they did was they kicked out Rick Warren. And so my theory, I mean, the question that is going to determine if if the SBC is actually, um, you know, off a cliff or not here. I mean, I think you, you should have gotten out of the SBC a long time ago if you're an SBC church. But it's still fun to watch. And so I think the question we need to ask ourselves is what does the SBC intend on doing with these 1,928 churches that Rick Warren mentioned? Even if it was half of those, a thousand churches. For churches to be removed, they have to do this big vote at the conventions, uh, I guess. And, and you know, maybe somebody could inform me if I'm wrong. But that's a lot of ballots to count. Somebody, somebody even said to me on social media that like, he personally counted the ballots at a previous convention for removing a church. And that is a lot of ballots to count. That's, you know, how many members, how many messengers show up to the SBC conventions? Uh, however many that is, that's the that's as many ballots as there are times 1,000 for the churches that are being disfellowshipped or 2,000, right? And so I don't have any hope whatsoever that the SBC is actually going to do anything to cut out all of the egalitarian churches within the SBC. I think this is a total political move, and I think this is not a sign of hope for the SBC, and so we should hold our breaths. I think this is just uh, the, the SBC going left a little slower than Rick Warren wanted to take it. Not a good sign, not something to celebrate. But I think we can celebrate the justice that was done to Rick Warren, the public meltdown he had, and the embarrassment that he faced for his uh, stupidity and bad choices. So I hope that was enlightening. Hope that gave you something to think about uh, and that it was educational. Catch you next time. God bless. 